talk with the, with this group about critical illness protection. But before we get into the details, I really want to share a story with you to kind of set the stage for today. Um, there was a, a lumberjack camp, and there was one guy in the lumberjack camp. His name was Big Brutus. Now, Big Brutus was like 6'5", 315 pounds in all muscle. And there was a, a new lumberjack that came in, Little Larry. Little Larry was about 5'3", 125 pounds. And Little Larry challenged Big Brutus to a wood chopping contest. And the camp got all excited, and, and Little Larry said to Big Brutus, he said, if I win, I get two months' pay, and I get your private cabin for the next year. And the camp got all excited, and Big Brutus thought, oh, this is going to be easy. And so 9 o'clock in the morning, they started chopping away. And about 9.45, little Larry got up, left for about 15 minutes. He was back at 10 o'clock. And at 10.45, he got up and left, and then came back at, at 11 o'clock. And he did this every hour until the... The, the whistle went off at 5 o'clock. And what happened, they looked at the piles of wood, and little Larry had chopped more wood than Big Brutus. And Big Brutus was really mad. He couldn't figure out how this guy had ever beat him. And he said, what were you doing when you disappeared for 15 minutes every hour? He said, I was going out to sharpen my axe. So I want you to think about that story whenever you're sitting in on a webinar and um, our meeting, because the time here is to help you sharpen your mental axe. <coughs> We've got two objectives that we really want to accomplish today. What I really would love you to walk away from this call with is an understanding of the market potential for critical illness protection. I want you, more importantly, to understand the need and then the markets that you, that, that where critical illness fits. And I'm only going to go into a couple markets because one of the unique things about critical illness protection is no matter what market you're in, whether it's selling disability protection to doctors, whether you're selling mortgage term insurance, whether you're selling health insurance, critical illness fits with each and every market. One of the questions when I'm speaking to live groups is I always ask, ask everyone to stand up and say, if you know anyone who's been diagnosed with cancer, had a heart attack or stroke, sit down. And guess what happens with every group I do that with? The whole audience sits down. The fact is that in the United States today, Everyone knows someone who has had a critical illness. It touches each and every one of our lives. So what is critical illness protection? It's really simple. It pays a lump sum on the diagnosis of one of the covered conditions. I have a $25,000 policy. I'm diagnosed with cancer. The surety is going to send me a check for $25,000. You know, and, and one of the best ways to describe it is basically it works a lot like life insurance, only you don't have to die to collect the benefits. Now, critical illness protection, the money can be used for any reason, but the purpose of it is very simple. It's designed to remove the financial stress. Now, I want you to think about someone you know who's been diagnosed with cancer, had a heart attack or stroke. We'll take cancer, for example. Okay, when someone hears those words that they have cancer, first thing that goes through their mind are the life and death issues. Second thing is, what's ahead with the treatment? And the third thing is, how do I pay for it? The whole purpose of critical illness protection is one thing, and that is to take away of that, that financial stress and worrying about how they're going to pay for it so they can focus on the most important thing, and that's recovery. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I've been in the business for 30 years now. 
And one of the questions I ask groups is, in that 30 years, what's happened to term insurance rates? Well, I can tell you they are 50% to one-third of what they were when I first started in the business. And why is that? Okay, it's not because insurance companies are good guys, although some of us are good. Um, it's basically because we're living longer. That's why the rates have gone down. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. In the last 25 years, what's caused the greatest improvement in mortality? It's the fact that the cancers, the heart attacks, and strokes, because of medical advances, don't kill us like they used to. In most cases, when it happens today, we survive. Where a generation ago, we, were di we died. Now, I hate statistics, okay, but I just want you to look at this chart for a minute. And this shows the increase in survival rate from 1950 to 2000. And you can see that for cancer example, for example, the five-year survival rate has more than doubled in those 50 years. The survival rate for stroke has more than tripled, and the heart attack survival rate is increased by 75%. You need critical illness insurance not because you're going to die, but because you're going to survive. And that's a quote from Dr. Morris Bernard. One of the things that is different about critical illness insurance, and it's a good thing, is it was not created by an insurance company, but it was created by Dr. Bernard. And the story behind critical illness insurance is incredible. Dr. Bernard, and many of you know that name because he assisted his brother Christian with that first heart transplant back in December of 1967, was practicing medicine in South Africa. And as a doctor, with the advances that had taken place in medicine, he saw he was able to heal his patients physically. But he said the financial stress was killing his patients and working against everything he was trying to do as a doctor. And so he actually started going around talking to insurance agents, talking to financial advisors, talking to insurance carriers about this idea of a product that would pay a lump sum on the diagnosis of, <coughs> of one of the covered conditions. Finally, Crusader Life introduced the first critical illness product, and it has spread around the world. Today, critical illness insurance is sold in over 55 countries, and if you look at insurance product sales around the world, it is the fastest growing product in terms of, of new sales. Now, this is going to be pretty basic, and this applies no matter what market that you're in. You know, the good news is we survived the critical illness. The bad news is there's a price that goes with it. And if you look at this this chart that's up there. What this says that when you look at the cost of cancer, for example, two-thirds of the cost, that 65 percent, are not covered by health insurance. Only one-third is covered by health insurance. And I'll tell you, when I first saw this chart, I didn't believe it. So I said, I got to drill down and see really what makes this up. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. And you can see how we get to that two-thirds very easily. What are some of those indirect costs not covered by health insurance? One is loss of income for the person suffering critical illness. The other piece of loss of income that people don't think about is what about the spouse, their partner, or caregiver? You know, we've got a great thing in this country called the Family Leave Act. And I think it applies to employers with more than 25 employees. It says if a person has a sick relative that they need to take time off from, from work to take care of, they can do it. That's the good news. The bad news is they don't get paid. Um, home modifications is another one. I had an insurance agent, a uh, lady that runs a small property and casualty agency here in Lincoln, go to a meeting, do, attend a meeting I did a couple of years back. 
And she came up to me after I did the presentation on critical illness and said, Ken, where were you five years ago? Her husband had had a stroke. And she said, we had to take out a second mortgage on our house. She said, you don't think about it. You know, we had the extra expenses, yeah. But she said, you know, we had to put in a ramp for the wheelchair. And then she said, you don't think about it a lot of times, but the wheelchair was wider than the doorways in their house. So they had to expand the doorways. And then they had to make bathroom modification. Another one's experimental treatment. Now, there is no health insurance in this country that covers experimental treatment. There are drugs that, and, and to be considered not experimental, a drug has to be approved by the FDA. And we all know how fast the FDA moves. Now, there are drugs out there that have not been approved by the FDA that can help people who have cancer, can help people with heart conditions. And there's only two ways that people can access that. First way is to be included in a study, and then the second way is to have the money for, to pay for it. Child care and domestic assistance, if someone with a critical illness has children, someone's going to have to watch the kids. The other one is that even if a person is single, you're going to need to get someone to come in and take care of the house, take care of the lawn, and, and maybe even bring meals in. And then transportation and lodging for family members and caregivers during treatment. One of the examples I used is we had a former employee, Eric Tepley. Eric, at 28, was diagnosed with colon cancer. And pretty much the doctor told him, said, you go to MD Anderson or you're going to be dead. He and his wife had just had a baby. And, you know, he's going to MD Anderson. And his wife wants to go along. And they want to take their son. And he said, you know, when, when you go there, number one, the hotels there aren't cheap. He said, number two is they give you a block of time, and you don't know when you're going to have to be there to go. So he said they, they had to take their fa his father-in-law along to watch their, their child. Well, Amy went with him for treatment. And he said, you know, if you don't have, they didn't have the six months worth of income built up. And... He said, so you just start putting everything on the credit card. And he said, even with great health insurance, it was still not enough to cover the bills. Now, I am not going to talk a lot about product. Basically, I want you to understand need. I want you to understand some markets where it's being sold. And, but I'm, I'm just going to touch on Assurity's uh, simplified critical illness for a minute. What we've done, and we were really the innovators with this, is basically we've got 12 covered conditions, and we took the, three, the 12 conditions and broke them out into three categories, cancer, heart stroke, and then the other. And the way the critical illness plan works is if I buy a $25,000 benefit, I'm diagnosed with invasive cancer, I'm going to get a check from a surety for $25,000, and that cancer category is over and done with. Two years later, I have a heart attack. A surety sends me a check for another $25,000, and that category is over and done with. Three years later, I am really unlucky and have kidney failure. A surety is going to send me another check for $25,000. That $25,000 benefit that I, I purchased has the potential to turn into a $75,000 benefit. So if I have health insurance, why would I buy critical illness insurance? And I'm just going to show you um, the agents that have stayed in the major med market are all packaging critical illness together with major med. And this is an example um, that we worked on a, on a case with an agent. Basically, you can say 45-year-old 40, male, female, three children. Okay, they have a $1,500 deductible right now, and they're paying $1,100 a month for it. The agent comes in and proposes that they increase the deductible from $1,500 to $5,000. The premium goes from $1,100 a month to $529. And the agent also included 
$20,000 critical illness and $10,000 on the children with a monthly premium of $58. So they've increased their deductible, but they've also savings of, have a savings of $513 a month. So why does why does critical why is critical illness package with major med? Number one is you get the extra expenses not covered by major med. We talked about that with the indirect cost, the direct cost. You got deductible, you have deductibles and copay. Then here's one a lot of people do not realize. I call it the double deductible. If you have a five thousand dollar deductible. You're diagnosed with cancer in November of this year. So for year 2012, you have a $5,000 deductible. Let me ask you, what happens January 1st? Guess what? It's a new calendar year, and you've got a new, you have a new deductible. So within a two-month period, instead of facing a $5,000 deductible, you're facing a $10,000 deductible. And then the other piece of it, too, is for the agents that are doing it. I don't know if anyone on here is selling major med coverage, but I will tell you this, is that with the mandatory loss ratios that went into effect on individual major med, commissions are one-third to half of what they used to be. And the only way many of those agents have continued to sell major med is by packaging critical illness together with it. So. I know everyone on this call sells life insurance. So if I have life insurance, why would I need critical illness insurance? And here's a couple things I want you to think about. What percentage of term policies do you think result in a death claim? The answer is 2%. Now, what percentage of mortgage foreclosures are due to death? It's only 3%. And this last statistic applies to both disability income and critical illness. It's amazing how it works out to be the same. What percentage of mortgage foreclosures do you think are due to a critical illness? 48%. I am 16 times more likely to have my mortgage foreclosed because of disability or critical illness than I am because of premature death. So, if you're selling life insurance, life insurance is no longer enough. You need both life insurance and you need critical illness insurance. Now, I, I, sh I usually put another slide in here before this. 25% of the people in England own a critical illness plan. And then I'll usually ask the question, why do you think they, they purchased it? And most people, the most natural response is because of their, their state-run health care program. And that's not the case. They do have private health insurance that if the waiting list become too long, they can go to a private doctor and, and have it paid for. The reason 60 to 65 percent of those people in the UK bought critical illness insurance was to protect their mortgage. Now, I really want you to stop and think, think about that because what's more likely to happen before age 65? Death or critical illness? They're, and depending on the age, you are probably four times more likely to have a critical illness than you are to die prematurely. And again, the question is, what's more likely to cause mortgage foreclosure, death or critical illness? And I usually ask the question here is, who, who sold term insurance to protect the mortgage? And one of the easiest discussions to open up is critical illness as mortgage protection. And I don't care if you're dealing with a blue collar worker, a policeman, fireman, or a high-income executive, or a doctor, or a dentist. This works with each one of those markets. So what would you say to, to open up the discussion? All you got to do is ask one simple question. 
And if this is not a client, this is a, a good way to get in and open a discussion with a prospect. You have the new kind of mortgage insurance or the old kind of mortgage insurance. And you know what the person's going to say is, I probably have the old kind or can, what's the difference between the two? And my response is, the old kind only pays your mortgage off if you die. The new kind still pays your mortgage off if you die. But in addition, if you're diagnosed with cancer, have a heart attack or stroke, it'll take care of your mortgage payments for two or five years. And the cost for this is less than a cup of coffee a day. Two things I want you to notice that really works well is basically if you've sold the term insurance, you can come in and put the critical illness insurance right on top of that. Second thing is notice I'm only worrying about covering two years or five years worth of mortgage payments, not the home mortgage. Next thing is, did you notice how much I said it cost? It costs a cup of coffee a day. Now, if, if it's a young guy, it's a convenience store cup of coffee. If it's someone my age who is a tobacco user, it becomes a giant frappuccino at Starbucks. But I always challenge groups, and I said, no matter which market you're working in, just ask three people a day this question for the next five days. And you know what? I will guarantee that you'll sell some critical illness insurance. And if it doesn't work, you put, pick up the phone, call me, and say, Ken, you have no idea what you're, what you're talking about. Follow-up question is, would it reduce your stress if you're diagnosed with cancer and your mortgage will be paid for the next two years? I've asked that question to thousands of people, and no one's ever said no to it. One other thought, I know some of you are in the, the working the small business market, and I want to share something with you, critical illness as loan protection for the small business owner. And I kind of want to set the stage with a story. When I first got started and involved in critical illness protection, it had been going for Can up in Canada for a couple of years. And I started calling agents and financial advisors up there saying, hey, what are you doing to sell this stuff? And I talked to a guy, MDRT producer, life and qualifying MDRT producer in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And he shared with me a story. He said, Ken, I did a presentation about nine months ago to two clients. The two guys are partners in a business. One's 32, the other is 36. He said, I did a presentation on critical illness protection, and they didn't buy it. He said, a few months ago, he said the 32-year-old was diagnosed with cancer. And he said, when their banker heard that they had, they, he heard that the 32-year-old had cancer. And he said, Ken, you know, they had a loan at the bank. It's called a demand loan. And, you know, the good news with a demand loan is usually you're getting a lower rate of interest. The bad news with a demand loan is your banker can call it at any time. And guess what their banker did? When he or the 32-year-old had cancer, he basically called the loan. So stop and think about this. you got two guys. They have their whole life wrapped up in this business. The 32-year-old is starting chemo treatments. Now, what banker is going to loan money to two partners on that basis? Corey said to me, he said, think about this. If they had been able to tell their banker that we've got a check coming for $50,000 or $100,000 within the next 30 days, he said, I think that would have made all the difference in the world. So for your small business clients, here's the question to ask them. What would your banker do if he or she heard you were diagnosed with cancer? double your line of credit, be totally unconcerned, or withdraw your credit completely. Now, I'm wondering how many people recognize that, 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 that picture that's up there. That's Vince Lombardi. And I've been reading or rereading um, a biography of his called When Pride Still Matters. And one of the things that really hit me with his success with the Packers as coach of the Packers is, is one, he understood his players. 
The second piece of it is they stuck with fundamentals and they stuck with basics. And they executed to the nth degree. Now, and, and that's one of the things I think that's crucial as you start to get involved with critical illness protection is the point is it's not the product. It's the need. And the thing is to keep it simple because what it's all about is educating your clients, your prospects on the need for the product. And, and it's important to drive home the point that the reason critical illness ex ex exists is not because we're going to die, but we're going to survive. And then I will reiterate this. One of the things that I found is that almost every agent outside the major med market who has, who has success selling critical illness protection tells them the Dr. Bernard story. And the fact that this was not created by an insurance company, but created by a doctor. So what do you think is the most common objection that a prospect or a client is going to come up when with critical illness insurance? The most common objection is it's not cost. It's I don't think it's going to happen to me. And I'm going to give you four questions that you can take and go and use. And really, they are the four questions really help the client to see the need for critical illness. And I want you to think about the, these questions as I ask them. Okay, do you know anyone who's been diagnosed with cancer, had a heart attack or stroke? And in most cases, you're going to get a family member or you're going to get a friend. And the reason this question is so valuable in the sales process is because it takes it from being a statistic and makes it personal. The second question is, was it expected? And they're always going to say no. And this takes away the objection that I don't think it could happen to me because you come back to the fact that if they mentioned Sam having cancer and you ask them, did Sam expect to have it? They're going to say no. And it drives home the point that no one expects to have it. No one thinks it's going to happen to them. But that doesn't change it. And it also drives home the fact that Many times cancer can be random. Third question, was it tough emotionally or financially for them, their family, or their business? They're going to tell you the financial issues that came up, and they're also going to tell you how it was emotionally challenging for the family in a lot of cases. And then if someone walked in and said, hey, here's some cash. Use it however you think is best. Would this have helped? And everyone says yes. And this last question illustrates the fact that basically the, 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 the client, the claimant, can take the money and use it however they want. So how do you determine, how do you determine a need for critical illness? Here, here, here I'm going to give you some simple ways to do this. One is six months worth of income, two or five years worth of mortgage payments, or credit plus credit card payments, car payments, all that. And it keeps coming back to the fact that if, if you're diagnosed with cancer and you know you're going to get a lump sum check for six months worth of income, would that reduce your financial stress? So why am I so passionate about critical illness protection? Just look on that sheet, on that slide that's up there right now. I mean, those are real people. Those are real claims. And I will tell you, I have been in this business a long time, and I have never seen a product that makes a difference as quickly as critical illness can. A um, couple examples I, I will tell you about. Um, one that really touched me had an agent, part-time agent in the business here in Nebraska, did a meeting. Um, about five years ago, a couple months after after the after the meeting, she bought a policy on herself and her husband. Her husband had a heart attack. He went into the hospital on a Friday. She went in to see him over the weekend, but on Sunday morning, she said when she went in, she said you could see the stress of the world on him. 
and you know he didn't know what was to happen, what was ahead the next week, but he knew he wasn't going to work on Monday. And she told him we had that they that, that she had brought, brought the critical illness policy, and she said you could see the stress leave him. And she called me that that Monday morning and said, "Can it does exactly what you say it's going to do? It takes away the stress." I can think back to the first claim I was involved with, with, with a woman in her early 50s in Florida. A um, couple months after issue, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She would not tell her employer that she had the breast cancer until she had the check in her hand. Uh-oh, i got to tell you about a warning. Okay, this is, I'm, I'm glad if you haven't heard about this, it, I, it's, it's, it's great. I'm bringing you great news to be prepared. There's a disease going around affecting our industry. It's called FTIS. Have you heard about it? Okay. This is something, I think it started in home offices, and it has spread to distribution. It's failure to implement syndrome. What happens, you sit in on a webinar like this, and you say, hey, Ken, that's a, great, that's a great webinar, and then you go out and do nothing. The key is, you know, you and I only have so much time, and we have to make the most of it. What I'm going to suggest is that after Tracy posts this to, get, posts this to the Plus Group webinar or site, listen to it again. Take one or two of the ideas that we shared in a short time and go out and put it to use. Before we take questions, I'm going to give you something else to take away. And I really, it, it, it's so fitting with this because there is such an incredible opportunity with, with critical illness protection. And it is so needed. You know, there was a Persian king hundreds and hundreds of years ago that called his advisors together. And he told his advisors, he said, I really want to put together the wisdom of the ages to give the future generation. And so the advisors went to work, and they came back with 12 volumes. And the king said, nah, that's way too much. Nobody's ever going to take the time to read that. And he said, go back to work and get it so people read it. They came back with a volume. He said, that's too much. And they, they came back again. They got it down to a chapter, a paragraph, and then finally got it down to one sentence. And, that one, and when he saw that, he said, that's it. That's the wisdom of the ages. And that one sentence is, there ain't no free lunch. There ain't no free lunch. And anything new, anything different, any great opportunity, you have to work at it. So with that, Tracy, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to take any. Yep, if you have a question, you just need to type it in in the question pane. It should be on your right side. Uh, I do have a couple. Uh, Ken, uh, here's the first one. It is, what is the underwriting like, medical issues, and financial requirements? OK. The, Two things, two ways I'll approach it. We have a, a simplified critical illness that goes up to 50,000. That's just a pure accept, reject application. And basically, you answer the health questions, no. You fit within the build chart. And I can put on 100 pounds and still qualify with the build chart. Um, that's easy. For the higher limit one, with going from 50 to 500,000, Underwriting for that is like qualifying for preferred life, and the financial requirements are minimal. We've been able to use the, 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 the higher limit critical illness in a lot of situations where there's been issues because of financials with, with disability income and qualifying for adequate amounts of disability income, or like with doctors that are only working two days, two days a week. We've been able to use it in, in those situations. Um, and financial underwriting requirements are not an issue. I mean, I had one last week I'll share where they had significant assets. And because of the assets, um, they couldn't get any disability income. 
we were able to put together a nice critical illness package for them. Okay. Um, next question. Can you tell me what the applications to issue rate is? On, on the simplified, it is about 93%. On the fully underwritten, it is about 70%. And I'll tell you one of the things that we're doing on the fully underwritten um, is we are in the process, and I'm doing a webinar right after this before it, is putting together a pre-qualification checklist to make it easier so that there's no surprises in the underwriting process so that until you get comfortable with the underwriting, it's going to make it a lot easier. Next one. Is the plan HSA compliant? Can you have the insurance in conjunction with an HSA? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, do you only sell this instead of LTC if they are higher risk, or are there any other scenarios? By this, I mean critical care policies. Okay. With um, we, we're not selling it in the place of of of. Uh, well, we're, we're not trying to replace long-term. Now, they said LTC, right? Yes, they did. But okay. then they said, but I mean critical care policies. Okay. We're, we're, we do have some people who have been doing long-term care that are selling critical illness because of all the, the, the disruption that's taken place in the long-term care market the last, the last year. They've started to focus on it. Um, the real market for critical illness protection, and I, I've always looked at it this way, is really 35 through about 55. If you look at our average age at issue, it's right around 43. Where this product is so valuable is when, when an individual is accumu accumulating assets. Um, I see 55 and above, or in the 50s, as more when the, when the individual has the assets ac accumulated, I see more of the long-term care as asset protection or asset conservation. Okay. Um, if there are any other questions, we can address them now. Or if you think of something later, you can always send me an email or your local Plus Group office if you need uh, more information. Okay. Um, I guess we did well. Ken, thank you. I thought it was great and um, did a great job. We appreciate you and Assurity for helping us out today. And again, if, there's, if you have any questions, anyone, please feel free to contact your local Plus Group office. And as mentioned, it will be on our website. It takes about 24 hours. Also, you should get a follow-up email that will have a link that will show you. You'll be able to view the whole thing all over again. Oh, I'm getting a couple more. One more question. Oh, <laughs> and I'll ask you that later, Ken. Okay. <laughs> okay, everyone. Thank you so much, and uh, oh. have a great day. And Ken, thank you again. Thank you, Tracy. Okay. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day.